Howard Doss. Sean Larkin. Man, so we've got a unique podcast here today. Um, we are actually in Nashville, Tennessee. We are. At Nashville Barrel Company. Um, thank you to Mike Hines and James Patterson for having us out here. Cross paths with these guys, God, a year ago maybe. Yeah, yeah. Originally, when we were in Kentucky. Out in Kentucky at the Willett Distillery. And we have been fortunate to be out here before, and anybody that follows us on social media saw the shenanigans we had out here a couple months. And, we did. Uh, we got to do some barrel picks, uh, meaning for those that don't know, we got to actually sample barrels of, of bourbon and pick bottles that we like between myself, you, and Jason. And they have bottled these up. They have. And together, between ourselves and Nashville Barrel Company, uh, we've got two different bottles that we are selling starting today. Um, one of them here we have called Blue Line Bourbon for, you know, for, for me very personal, obviously, for all our, our guys out there in blue, cops across the country, and anybody that supports them. And we have partnered up with the National Fallen Officers Foundation. Hell of a cause. Hell of a cause. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to be selling bottles, obviously, out here today. People will listen to this later, but they'll be offered online as well. And 25% from every one of these bottles will go directly to the National Fallen Officers Foundation. Which that's 25 bucks. That is 25 bucks. They are $100 a bottle. Um, hey, with well, some luck, we're going to sell these things out today. Right. You and, can get a signed uh, one from you today. We, huh? are, we are autographing them for, for you know people out here today. And so I also want to say to our listeners out there, uh, if you hear any other background noise going on, it's we're not in our regular studio. We are literally here in their tasting, tasting room, room um, and they are open right now. So they've got people picking, uh, drinking. Barrels. They've got people buying, <laughs> drinking. You can hear someone banging a, 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 a barrel right now. So it you, there'll be a little more background noise, but we're going to have some uh, some great interviews. Hey, well, let me. Um Let's go back to the Fallen Officers Foundation. Tell us a little bit about that, man. Man, it's actually uh, so kind of uh, – I was doing a, a Fox News thing of, of, of all deals, uh, gosh, maybe a year ago, and the president of the National Fall, Fallen Officers Foundation is actually a Dallas police sergeant. And he and I just happened to be uh, on there talking law enforcement-related deals. And when we kind of came up with this idea to do you know, a fundraiser with this bottle – um, anybody that knows us in Tulsa knows we try to do a lot of different things in Tulsa. We were just at a, a Best Buddies deal for special needs kids this past week as well. Um, but this one was, uh, you know, something that I, that, that's obviously dear to me. Um, yeah. Law enforcement's kind of taken it in the ass, you know, in the, in the, uh, the media for the last couple years, especially this last year. And there are still cops dying that do not get the coverage of – other people dying right and so this is a way that uh, a small way we can kind of throw some money back to a, a large national nonprofit organization that supports police man and we're fucking stoked to be involved with it i guess yeah. that's the best way to put that uh, absolutely yeah very much so and honestly they, hey these bottles look cool as shit. They do look I mean, cool as shit. It says Blue Line Bourbon on there, Nashville Barrel Company, and then we've got the logo for the National Fallen Officers Foundation. So anybody that – one, the, the products Nashville Barrel Company puts out to begin with are fantastic. fantastic and obviously a unique bottle to have for anybody's collection. Heck, yeah. Well, hey, Sean, guess what? What's that, buddy? We got uh, we got a Nashville retired police officer here today. Do we now? Yeah, he, went, he was on the force for um, 10 years, decided that. he wanted to go ahead and retire, which – that's pretty awesome, and start his own private investigation company. He's been doing real well at that. Just wrote a book, started start his own nonprofit. Are you, it sounds like you're talking about myself. Almost yeah, well, it, it almost is. I mean, heck, I think that I need to do something like that. But today we got Bobby Young. How you doing, sir? I'm good. Thank y'all for having me today. Absolutely, we're glad that you're here with us. I hope you like bourbon because I'm about to pour us some and we're going to drink it. I'll do. Fill it up because this is the uh, cocktails and cocktails. So for uh, you know our listeners, we got Jason sales our 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 buddy here that kind of helps run some of the audio video and uh, how's all these other outside sounds right now jason is it we're okay yeah because you can hear people stomping slamming barrels there you go mr sales just roll with it yeah absolutely all right well cheers here's to you thanks for being on here you go jay So, Bobby, um, we'll kind of get into your – that's good. That that's is smooth. nice. I'll take 10 of those. 10 of those? Yep. Okay, I'll we've take got – 10, ring it up. 
Done. Sign them all. That's Done. a good one, isn't I it? I love that. That's right. That grabs your tongue. That is smooth, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, Bobby, you were a Nashville police officer. Uh, I know Howard got it wrong, said 10 years, 11. Oh, of course, so, of course 11. You know, yeah, yeah, you got to get that extra year in. Uh, it, it, hey, in, in the, uh, the, the in the world of retirement, that extra year makes a little bit of difference. It so does. It does. It will add up an over extra, time. Uh, Fifty to seventy-five dollars when I turn fifty-three. See, there you go, wait. man. There can't you wait. go. Hey, compounding interest. By the time you're like two hundred and fifty, it'll be worth like three hundred bucks. Exactly. Yeah, it really so, has a uh, worth that year. Saving for kids' college. There you go. Um, so, kind of, you know, go through. Um, obviously, you know a little bit of history. How your father was law enforcement and and, and that type of deal, and uh, talk about that and how you kind of got into the police profession yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So, just growing up, like probably most anybody watching your father as a role model and the hero, you know, I really enjoyed seeing him work within law enforcement. He was always doing undercover ass- ass- uh, assignments. He started uh, as a narcotics officer, but then was hired on as a railroad policeman, which he always said people didn't know what the railroad police were or who they were until you were halfway to jail. So, but he did a lot of, um, internal stuff with the company as well with csx it was it's a huge railway all east of the mississippi but i just wanted to follow in his footsteps went off to college got a criminal justice degree and just as i was about to graduate he retired and he kind of retired under some bad circumstances and what it come down to was politics and as a 22 year old in college i didn't understand what that was at all So I went on to the Metro Nashville Police Department, started there in 2007, and with the Nashville Police Department, it's probably about 1,500 to 1,800 officers, so there's a lot of different units. So I knew going in that I could probably try to work hard, work my way up, and pick and choose where I wanted to go. So, And Bob, let me ask you about your father. So just like you said, a lot of people don't know what the railroad police do until you're halfway to jail. Um, I myself know a little bit about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if Howard, I know less. Knows, Howard knows less. Um, and I guarantee there's people out there who have no idea. So kind of give us a little rundown on that. Absolutely. So there's not many of them. I think he was four, one of four in the entire state of Tennessee. And it is a federal position. So mm-hmm. he retired fully federal, unfortunately passed away in 2017, which Sorry was a hear that. hard part in my life while I was a police officer with Metro. But watching him do what he did, it was everything from guarding shipments of frozen french fries to missiles being traveled and and carried by the military. So it was not only keeping the, the cargo safe within the train, but also anything from as petty as trespassing to people getting hit by trains every time. Mm-hmm. A body showed up around the tracks. I, th- I think 50, 75 feet, 100 feet on both sides of the of the train tracks, they own that entirely. So anything that ever happened around the tracks per se, and then there's a huge hump yard in Nashville. A where, hump yard? That's right, a hump yard. <laughs> so, and and that, that's so funny how you you pick up on one word, and that so played into my dad's downfall as a as a railroad policeman. He was teaching a class, and someone misinterpreted one word, and that's really what led to his downfall. Thirty one years there as a railroad detective, and had to. You know, like most cops, you're you're a little brash, and sure. you know you don't want to take any shit from anybody. And he didn't, and he said, well, "I've got my time in, I'm out." But when he left, he realized I have nothing to do, and he wanted to continue doing that work that he knew how to do for thirty something years. So he went in the security industry, worked over at Opryland, which is one of the largest, best hotels in in Nashville, and he was a security supervisor there. Okay. What was that word? Well, what was that? What was the word that he said? You said it was the downfall, misinterpretation of one word. So he used the term yard master, and someone complained on him that it was porch monkey. It doesn't even make any sense, but that is what was interpreted, and that he was called racist and sexist and all these other things. 
So they were trying to, and he was teaching a class with 50 to 60 state troopers. Right. And that was part of his job too, is training and teaching. And it was just, it was so silly because it, it wasn't even really part of his duties as a law enforcement officer, you know, out there getting in trouble like you would think. Right. It's just, you made, you, you said a statement and someone misinterpreted it, made a complaint, and that's how we got there. And Jesus. Forced in retirement, I just thought I was going to be the next railroad policeman. You know, I never envisioned myself being the cop that was writing tickets. Right. Who likes that guy? Right. right. Well, hey, there's cops out here that <laughs> love doing it. They like stopping soccer moms and writing them tickets and State working traffic accidents. Yeah, right, there yeah. you go, man. Yeah. There I you said go. it. I hey, to say each it. his own. Yes. But, yeah. but that's one of the, be- the the benefits like you were, you know, talking about going to Nashville. Very large agency mm-hmm. or, you know, 1,500, 1,800 officers, a lot of different opportunities. Um, when you get out of the academy, I'm assuming – Nashville is probably like a lot of other departments. You do have to start out as that street cop writing tickets and so forth. Absolutely. And then you can kind of transition into other things, which sounds like even in a short 11-year career, you did quite a bit of. Yes, that's correct. So initially when I came on, there was kind of this unwritten rule where you didn't really become a detective until you had three years on, but it kind of dissolved very quickly. And now you can become a supervisor within three years. So you know, not that they've lowered the standards, but there's a, I mean, God awful problem with law enforcement in general. They're not supported. They're leaving in, you know, thousands and thousands. I mean, I left myself for all kind of different reasons, but I actually remained on the Fraternal Order Police Board in Nashville for a while until I started my own nonprofit, just getting too busy. Um, but I'm obviously a big supporter. My dad was a police officer. My mother-in-law and father-in-law both retired after 30 years with Metro. And my brother-in-law is the current training, uh, or he's, he's an officer, but he's the training officer at the canine. At canine. So he trains the dog. So um, it's kind of like that show Blue Bloods. Um, but and my, wife's, my wife's my wife's a lawyer. So oh, there you go. Yeah. What side of what type of law she practice? So she did a little bit, a little bit of civil law first and hated it and because it was like hustling you had to get your own clients and then she went to the department of safety with the state of tennessee so what she does which you'll know this is civil asset forfeiture yep so and of course that's always a hot button topic very much so i always stand up for it because that's what i did we did at the 20th drug task force that no longer exists so let me interrupt you for a second what is civil asset forfeiture? It's uh, basically if there's a criminal investigation into somebody for everything from typically, you know, for us at the, the police department level, it's drug related type of stuff. People that are accumulating cars, money, houses, um, you know, through illegal means. Right. And we arrest them for a crime. It, it is actually not, at least I don't know how it is here in Tennessee, but in Oklahoma, we don't have to prove that Howard Doss has 50000 in his house, that brand new Corvette or whatever, but no job. I don't have to prove that it was by drug proceeds. If we've arrested or if we've arrested you for a drug related charge, you have to prove how you basically gathered all the belongings you have and the money. Did you do it legal or illegally? Sure. And so if you take somebody who doesn't have a job, didn't get an inheritance, is caught selling drugs and has all these things, the state of Oklahoma, the Tulsa Police Department, we're going to try to seize your assets, your money. And we use that money. It's how we pay for training. It's how we pay for equipment. It's how we send uh, – hell, that's how we pay for our cell phones, Tulsa Police Department, is all through seized money huh. that takes care of that type of stuff. Same type of thing here, I'm assuming? Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Are those also the cars that you see every once in a while to be plastered at the cop car, but it's like a Ferrari and said this was seized? Or <laughs> Literally, something? yes. So I'll tell like, you how that We w- took this away from the bad guys? Yeah, and, and I'll tell you how that works is so some guy's got a really nice car. We seize it. We're going to find out there's a lien on it. And if, uh, you know, let's say it's a $50,000 car that he's it's paid off, or if he only owes 10000 on it and it's worth forty. We'll, we'll pay even that last that last ten thousand off, so that the department will either keep it and use it, or the department will take it and then sell it and 
and, and reap the benefits of it. Well, Nashville, what kind of cars did you guys end up with? I want to hear this. I'll tell you. I mean, the best and the brightest uh, Nissan Altimas <laughs> and Honda Accords. That's pretty much what we had. Well, you know, and I'll say, so we have seized, obviously, there's fancy cars, you know, dope dealer cars that are rims and the whole shebang and stuff like that Dumps. are high-end cars. But if we're seizing the cars for us to use, you want something the, like I said, those cars he's talking about, a Ford pickup, something that blends in in traffic. You don't want something that sticks out anyway. So mm -hmm. we have seen some uh, Escalades and a few other high-end cars. And our, our deputy chief, uh, love him. I get along with the guy. He was kind of known for driving the <laughs> high-end seized vehicles we got. So yeah. if we got a nice he, – he did. He drove an Escalade for a long time. That was a seized yeah. car. Yeah, they had a big story probably six, seven-ish years ago, big policing for profit. Mm-hmm where one small unit was kind of dinged for that. So, you know, Nashville, bigger, and I would like to think better and maybe follow the rules a little bit better. So the high-end cars, we wouldn't, quote, put in service. Right. So generally those would get sold on EBID. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that's that, that, that was kind of the name of the game. And I, mean, I want to say the chief, when I was saying he had the Escalade, it wasn't his personal vehicle. Right, this was right. his... I just want to clarify for people <laughs> right. out there who listen. It, they had no. blue lights in it. Yes, this was this was literally this his Russia. city. It was his city car. It was a city vehicle that he drove every day, no different than a Mark Police car. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, and it's it's almost like a game. I mean, I can't tell you how many interviews and proffers I had done where large scale drug traffickers will tell you, I have two pots of money or more, but my first pot is my money that I've gotten up for my lawyer. That's my lawyer money. <laughs> And then this other money is just play money. <laughs> yeah. So. Well, and everybody says the same thing. It's like, you know, they'll have a bunch of money, a nice car, you know, no job. It's two things. At least, like I said, again, for, for me, it was always I cut yards because that's a cash business. <laughs> no, that's or, firefighters. Or I buy and sell cars. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. While, while they're working. Yeah. Right. Yeah, firefighters. <laughs> every firefighter no, I they know go, has a lawn business. And grocery shop and work out. <laughs> Take so, calendar I, pictures. I've said this before. There was a day I was heading to a hot call, driving by the fire station at work, and they were out in the yard playing fucking Frisbee <laughs> at the fire station. I swear. I swear. I was going to a hot call, hauling ass, and I was like, you fuckers, man. They're out there playing Frisbee in the front yard. With their shirts off. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Doing a, oh. doing a photo shoot. Oh, that's funny. Your time on the Nashville Police Department, uh, you got into narcotics, right? Yes, sir. That's correct. What kind of stuff were you doing with narcotics? I hear you maybe a few wiretaps. <laughs> yep, yep. We um, So the unit that I was on that's not there anymore was called the 20th Drug Task Force, and they were responsible for investigating large-scale drug trafficking organizations. And how you get those people is through wiretaps. So you listen to their phones and... We did several of those. I was there. I did a Dilaudid wiretap case. was kind of the first one, um, which is pills. Mm -hmm. and, and they're then, tough pills. They, yeah. They, they're the yeah. ones, like meth heads, people like heroin, they love Dilaudid. They're always asking for that at the hospital. So kind of what was going on is there's a city a little east of here, about 45 minutes away. They Some of the high-end dealers were driving an hour to Nashville paying $25 per one pill. It's a four milligram Dilaudid driving to Cookville and selling it for $40 a pop. So they were, you know, they had their own business going on. But besides, so I did Dilaudid one in 2012. And then the last case we worked turned an ounce of Coke into a hundred kilogram seizure 1.8 million dollars, 80 cars, 26 houses and properties, guns, indicted 90 plus people, and you got to break this one. You got to break <laughs> yeah, this case this down. You got to give us. You got that's a hell of a case. <laughs> yeah. So let's 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 break this one down a little bit. Kind of how it got started and mm -hmm. you know came to fruition. So the, the the longest story that I could say as quick as I can is just developed a source at a pharmacy gave me a tip about a cash buyer that was buying pills. I followed that person to the west side of town where they basically did a hand-to-hand -hand transaction at a gas station. So I took, I waited till the, what I thought was the buyer drive away. And they actually literally pulled right across the street and parked right next to me. I couldn't, it, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I, I don't know. It was like fate. So I jumped out, no vest on like a cowboy, an idiot. 
but I had a, a badge and gun, and I just opened his door. I said, give me, give me that shit you just got. And he's like, oh, what are you talking about? I, I said, you can either come off of it or you can go to jail right now. So that's kind of how that started. But the person had an ounce of Coke, and then, of course, like a lot of people, they'll flip or give information, and that really culminated – into developing a source that could get kilogram levels of cocaine. And then it's like a ladder. I mean, once you get the person at the bottom and you just start climbing the ladder. And then, you know, in Nashville, you have Hispanics that are bringing drugs across the border and bringing it into Nashville. So it's like once you get to the Hispanics and the Spanish speakers and stuff, you know that you've kind of hit that threshold where you likely – most likely you have the plug. Right. So, uh, but in this specific case, it took, um, we started it in April, in April of 2014, and we worked it all the way through. We were up on the wire from July of 14. We went down in December for a brief time, picked it back up in January, and then in March of 2015 is when everything was done over tallied everything up everybody was arrested and then about four months later we were told hey didn't even say nice job they just said hey uh, we're closing this unit down it'd been here 28 years self-funded but we're taking it we're taking it down no more so we'll, we'll, we'll dip into that but a seizure or a case that long so for for a Title Three wiretap that he did. That's a long time to be up on one, and um, there are a lot of rules that have to be done. And was was this a twenty four hour deal, or would you guys kind of lock in the time they were selling and just stayed on uh, on the phone basically during that time? Yeah, most days it was eight a.m. to midnight. Okay, and then if we got word of a load or something that may be coming in, we may extend the time. But we had to have a supervisor in the wire room, and it was either law enforcement or uh, assistant DA. Okay, and as I was going to say, so the wire room is you're getting text messages, you're getting the phone calls in real time, just as if I was to call you, it rings on this computer, and you put the headphones on, and you sit and listen to it, and you've got to make notes and decide if it's something worth keeping and then logging. I mean, it's a, it's very, very uh, manpower intensive running one because you've got to have guys in the wire room. You've got to typically have surveillance guys that are always – ready in case something comes in on a phone call that you need guys to do then you might have a stop car you know someone who's got to stop the cars if hey we want to do a takedown or something like that and another thing people need to understand is if there is a act of violence that's talked about on the phone call hey we're going to go kill this dude or hey we're going to go shoot we have to get involved at that point we have to now we'll Mm -hmm. let dope go you know you'll let stuff go so you can follow you know you hear a dope deal happen you want to follow man where's this guy going to so you know for the furtherance of the investigation but if there's something to do with violence we have to get involved in it and that oftentimes ends up bringing the wire down because of that so but like you were saying the hispanic guys that are up the kilo level they're not the guys down the street shooting each other and you know it's it's that's the that's the top tier you want to get to on these things yeah absolutely i mean it was a it was a great impact for the community, and we had a small team, five, six guys, and, you know, we worked very well together, and it just – it there, the best word, it just sucked Yeah, that the whole unit went away. I mean, I went from doing this to answering domestic calls and drawing rec diagrams, and so, it's bullshit. It, so, so, as far as it going down, what was the reason behind it? I mean, was it a manpower issue for your department? Like, hey, we need these bodies out in uniform? So, I wrote a book about it, but... Um, oh, and what's the name of that book? Let's the plug The Good that. Line. The Good Line? Okay. Yeah. So, it was... It, I, and, and the Good Line, sorry to cut you off, Bobby. The Good Line's not like, like a line of coke. We're well, not talking about hitting a good line of coke, are we? <laughs> right. So, it, it's a double meaning. It is the good line as in a line of coke, but it also, you know, listening to wires when you have the good line and people will say that, like, hey, is this the good line or is this the family line? Gotcha. Oh, the good shit. line okay. means that's the good one that you can sell the dope on. So, <laughs> All right. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Didn't no, mean to cut no, you off. No, no, totally good. Uh, the easiest way to describe it is, is politics and a – the, the district attorney that was there for 20-plus years and supported the unit and everything was going great and fine, um, the, the district attorney's office position they changed in 2014, and immediately we saw 
some pushback on what we were doing. And then ultimately there was something that was pointed out to the district attorney that didn't seem right on paper. We'll just say it like that. And I, in my opinion, brought to his attention. And then what do you know, within a month we're gone. So now the, the board of directors was several people, including the chief of police. So I think he had his hand in it as well. And I think ultimately it came down to politics, power, and money, which most big things happen that way. Absolutely. Um, you just need to add women to that list. Those yeah, are the things that you know, guys exactly. get themselves uh, jammed up on. <laughs> you could hear that on the good line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was – there was a lot of stuff. A lot no, of the, yeah, the things you hear on a on a T three on a on a wiretap, it's it's insane. And the well, number of girls these guys talk to, and they will be on. Uh, you'll have a phone call with their wife or their baby mama, and arguing with them. I'm on my way home right now. You know, blah blah blah, cussing them out. Then they'll hang right up, make another phone call. Hey, baby, hey, I'm about to slide through your house. And, you know, you you home? You got those panties on? I like. And they go, I'm serious, dude. This is dead ass serious. And they will show up at another. You know, it's just. And then their girl will come back. Why aren't you? I home thought yet? you were gonna be home. Oh, dude, it's it's comical because you're hearing everybody's conversation. Yeah. And you know, if it's not a uh, criminal, well, you know, a criminal phone call, basically, we can only listen to it if it is. Um, you know, we believe it's for the investigation. Sure. So we can't listen. You know, one uh, attorney calls, we can't listen to it all. You know, when if they're talking to the girl and they're literally talking about. Hey, we got Christmas pictures, you know, this Saturday. I'm going to stop by, you know, Whole Foods and pick up growth. Nobody's going to Whole Foods, but <laughs> well, we're going to stop by Whole Foods. And, you know, those calls, you, you, you minimize it, basically. You kind of tap out of it and let the phone call run, and then you tap. You can dip back into it, you know, every, every couple minutes and just listen to see if that's still what they're talking about. But you hear it all. You get the first 30 seconds or so free. So right away, you're always picking up everything. Yep. Well, you mentioned panties. I just had to say there was, there was a going, like, statement when a, when a load of keys came came in the guys at least in, on this wire they would talk to each other and say did you get the panties off how'd it look when you get the panties <laughs> off they're speaking in code yeah because they're talking about, about cocaine the product. Cocaine they're talking the about when they unwrapped it when they took the packaging off how did it look but they called it taking the panties off okay so I was well, like, Ooh, the- that's kind of good <laughs> But you knew what the hell they were talking about. Oh, yeah. They're like, hey, did you get that thing? <laughs> and the girl's like, what? You know, that thing. That that thing I keep in the safe under the bed. That thing. And it's like. 2.2 2 pounds of cocaine. Dude, I'm telling you, it's, it is literally that bad sometimes. It is oh, yeah. it is comical. And, sir, when you said thing, what yeah. did you mean? Yeah. 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 What were the descriptors for panties? Like, how did the panties look? Oh, Good panties. Yeah, well, it was uh, A1 or Diamond or, is it, you know, how does it look? Has it been hit? I mean, but you got you, you know, you got to keep up with that stuff. Oh, you do. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. And there's times you do. You, you'll hear something and you'll have to shoot a text out to your informant or make a phone call. Hey, man, what the hell does this mean? Oh, it is. I mean, you do. There's, you know, it changes up. So they're pretty good with it. So, so your guys' – unit that you loved put a lot of time in obviously was making a huge impact on drug distribution sales so forth here in here in nashville and just the seizures alone i mean that's as huge. we talked about the, the you know the the um the money seizures that's a that's a huge impact to the agency to yeah. disappear yeah absolutely and and it's it's really hard to explain unless you're the guys at the very very top and our task force director drug task force director brink fiddler he does he has a company called defend systems now but he as soon as they announced that they were taking us down he left he'd had 19 years in he went and did construction um i went to patrol another guy went and be a sro and now they did make another unit that was supposed to be the same as this but they moved him out of our back cave our wire our warehouse they had no wiretapping capabilities. They just put them in another office somewhere, but changed the name of it and all of that. But eh, I didn't get along with that supervisor, so I wasn't picked for the team gotcha. of six people. So to get a little more into you know, what happened with me, but went to patrol, worked my way back up to another drug unit. Then it took me a year and a half to get back to my old unit of the countywide drug unit. And the supervisor was caught stealing money. Oh. Uh. So, who happened to be in the motel room sting with him? That was me. So, 
you know, I was taking pictures and finding the stuff and what he was doing, it was all on, all on audio video, everything all uh-huh. wired up. He would find money and say, Hey Bobby, come take a picture of this. Cause I mean, sometimes I just was kind of like the camera guy, but he would take half of it and put it in his pocket. And then I would, it was a two story motel. I, I had never even seen a two more two story motel. Um, so I would walk up the stairs, take the picture. I'd walk back down the stairs. I'd keep searching. So they, I guess, feds and internal affairs, whatever, they planted like 25000 I think he stole 5000 And they were able to prove, like, after they took him down that he stole over the course of his career, whatever they could prove, he stole over $100,000. Wow. So into federal prison for about two years. But probably the biggest impact on me is – you know, in that time of the drug task force to working my way ba- back up, you know, I really wanted I wanted revenge because, you know, I was kicked down at such a level. I wanted to prove that I could get back to that spot. But in that time, I had to deal with the death of my dad and, you know, other, you know, person, you know. Life, life. life. Exactly. Yeah. And no one realizes you don't know what this guy is dealing with. And people absolutely don't know what cops go through at all. But that's why we have this podcast. There you go. There we go. That's why I'm getting 10 bottles of that's this it. delicious oh whiskey. Yeah, that, that is uh, damn good, honestly. So, good. you know, it was just, I, I think I was working so hard kind of for the wrong reasons, but it was self-fulfilling in a way. And the unit that I was on for a short time, I gained such great friends going through the death of my dad. You know, those guys were there. The unit that I went to i don't see that those guys were as supportive as as, at all but i made it back there as a unit of 10 supervisor got arrested so what'd they do to us bye back to patrol (laughs) sure dang and and, you know we've only got maybe 15 minutes or so and obviously want to talk about what you're doing now outside of law enforcement but the supervisor that got arrested i'm assuming they probably investigated numerous people in the unit uh, and, and this was a federal sting. It's very similar. We had one that happened in Tulsa back in 2010 where there were some guys suspected of, of stealing stuff. And it was a hotel sting. They did a hotel sting, had uh, audio video lined up in there, the feds. And um, it was actually an undercover FBI agent that was in the room. It was a Hispanic guy. This is what he does around the country is he poses as a you know a drug dealer himself. He just does undercover. And they had a uh, an informant for one of the officers that was now working for the government as an informant and said, you know, basically pass information off to these officers. Hey, this guy, there's a, someone in, in town at a hotel room right now passing through who's got a bunch of dope and money. So they did a search warrant on there and go inside. And there's guys who were putting a guy, I believe, one or two of them were putting money in their pocket. The audio went down. It was on video. And um, it, believe it or not, they actually went to trial on it. And the officers that night ended up turning in all the money still. The full amount wow. that was there actually was in there. So um, they called a drug dog over. They said they had separated money to have a dog hit on it. And uh, actually were found not guilty in federal court. Wow. So they did not. They lost their jobs with the police department. Right. But actually uh, it were wasn't not a criminal guilty. Offense, yeah. So. Point. Anyways, um, I'm assuming they probably looked at everybody in the squad, and you know, you guys had to be interviewed and oh, anything yeah. like I, that. I was interviewed multiple times, yeah. and you know, I kind of already saw the writing on the wall, and and you know, I just I literally had ha- had just had enough. Yeah. But kind of the turning point was when I realized they had no backup team or anything to take care of me. They saw him take the money and go down to the truck and put the money in the truck. And I asked them that in my interview later on. I said, why didn't y'all arrest him then? You saw him do that. Yeah, he's done. It's done. They said, we called an audible. So I said, well, the the dumb ruse that y'all use was that Homeland Security was out here. So I called a friend. Homeland Security was on this deal, too. They were on our deal, too. I called a Homeland Security friend. I said, hey, were y'all at this motel earlier? Yeah. This was and and they and they said no. We were at a holiday party, all of us. They said we didn't do we didn't do any search warrant. We were not over there on Elm Hill Pike today at all. So I told him that I said if I would have made that call while I was riding with him in the truck on the way back, don't you think he would have known something was up? Mm-hmm. I said, and you know, some cops are kind of crazy, especially when you get caught doing something. Right. 
you know, I said, well, what would have stopped him from blowing my brains out and then killing himself? You know, and and I said, did y'all have SWAT on standby? Did y'all do anything to protect me? Mm-hmm. They said no. They wow. called an audible. Tom Brady, you. So. All right, Bobby. So you are you left the police department, kind of became disheartened, and uh, you know, way some of the things were done. And you, you're wearing today your covert results uh, shirt, so we're going to get a little plug for that out there. But what I are you am. doing these days? I appreciate it. Yeah, so, I mean, there's no way at all I could ever be running a business or doing what I do now without my experience with the Metro Police Department. I'm very grateful for it. Yes, I was bitter at the end. I still have plenty of friends and lifelong friends with the department. It's, it's, it's a family thing, too. So, you know, I am bitter in a way, and it still comes around comes back but um i took what i learned and put it into my business my you know it's funny because one of the old guys in my unit was like hey law enforcement's in your blood well, i didn't realize that entrepreneurship is in my blood too my grandfather had the only paint store that in the 1900s in biloxi mississippi my um, uncle had a flower shop and a planning business in ocean springs mississippi my sister had a wedding business in nashville she's been she was doing restroom, that 15 so years and now she does content right creation has her own podcast angela prophet but you know she got into the entrepreneurs organization so when i left and started this company i set that as a goal and you have to kind of prove that not only is your revenue high enough to get into the entrepreneurs organization but also that you're successful and that you're also kind of a good person. I mean, you're not going to just let somebody into this global organization <laughs> if they suck. So, um, you know, Covert Results was born in probably early 2018, but I left the police department and the very next day I had a website, I had everything going, I had the logo. So, you know, mentors and family and friends helped me kind of kick it off and get to that spot and we do private investigations and armed security i say armed because we've been asked about unarmed i say we don't do that shit (laughs) (laughs) nobody wants to show up as unarmed security with no pistol so i'm right i've turned down plenty of jobs because you know thank you (laughs) exactly isn't it it it, is with the times the way they are, do you have venues, people, places, businesses that say, hey, we want security, but we don't want them armed? Have you had that happen? We have. Most of the time, they move on to the next uh, yeah. next company. And yeah. and I don't really recommend anybody because no. I, don't, I don't know. I just tell them I don't recommend it in general. Right. Now, where we've kind of carved a little niche is our business does mostly plain clothes security. I mean, I was – undercover nine of the 11 years so you know the ways to carry and different parts of the body you can carry you know kind of carry that over to business and i try to pitch that to people you know okay why don't you want arm well we don't want the police look well let me give you something to think about here right i can you can have an arm person which that has come into wedding events because they don't want somebody with a sure know, a, 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 rig standing a, out yeah, there yeah yeah you don't want a gun belt it's a distraction, but then also it's helpful in workplace terminations. So we can go in, we can blend into the environment and the workplace. They don't really know who we are, but they we're definitely armed, but they don't know it. Yeah. So it's it's kind of helped. And then the PI side, I mean, we luckily like one of the guys makes fun of me. So oh, you're friends with all these attorneys. I said I really really wasn't. I mean, I've only ever drank with like two attorneys. So and then uh, my, my wife is one, so drank with her, but. Um, you know, I just, I feel like all the time I spent in court and all the cases I work, I just was able to build a good reputation where, sure. and they knew the kind of work that we did. I mean, I was working nonstop. I used to be skinny and had more hair, but you know, it goes away working a wiretap. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I started the business and just really haven't looked back. Um, is this how you got into uh, some of the human trafficking stuff that you've been working on? Yes. So I've had lots of police officers. I mean, you know, unfortunately, lots are leaving the force. But I've had people come to me and said, hey, could you hire me or could I work with you? And I wish I could take on everybody. I'd probably have 50 to 75 investigators right now, and we've got 10. But one that I brought 
pulled away from Metro. He was he was there 21 years, and the last seven he did all the human trafficking cases. So I said, how can we use his expertise, and then my passion for like complex investigations and try to do something good for the community? Right. And I started doing research on nonprofits specifically for human trafficking, and there's already great ones here, but none are really focusing on where we think it's occurring, which is in the hospitality industry. So not only do we want to educate the hospitality industry, go into hotels and motels and do live in-person workshops, but we kind of want to have an investigative angle to that too. So, which is kind of funny because we wrote a resolution with the Metro Council which is like the biggest council in the U S kind of crazy, but they approved basically encouraging live in-person workshops, combating human trafficking, but also having licensed private investigators with human trafficking training to investigate possible tips that come in and then work parallel with law enforcement. So my, so my understanding on the human trafficking is that what you're saying is a lot of people are brought in from probably other countries, brought in to work in restaurants, kitchens, that kind of stuff here in Nashville. Because, And there's a lot to do in Nashville. There's a lot of food. There's a lot of people. So is that the kind of human trafficking you're talking about? Or are you talking more of like the illicit, I guess, pretty much all of it, huh? Yeah, I mean, you know, probably the most common is going to be your sex trafficking, what you think about, you know, prostitution rings. But if you, what people don't realize but talk about is is the children and how vulnerable they are with those damn phones right. you know everything's on the internet and predators are on there and you know there's there's all different types of human trafficking labor trafficking but probably the most common and what we're, we are seeing in nashville is sex trafficking and it's occurring in hotels and motels small low-income motels here on Galton, Dickerson Road, all you know, major thoroughfares, but also in your high-end places too. So, and you know, doing the research, what I learned and what we knew from investigating drug traffickers is Nashville is only one of, I believe, seven cities that has three major interstate systems huh. coming together. So it's like a traf- trafficker's dream to hide within all the interstates here. And there's a lot of people. It's supposed to be the it city. Yeah, I say this place, I mean, it's like Vegas. For people who have never been here, Nashville is kind of like Vegas in the middle of the country. I mean, it is a busy, busy place and lots of uh, lots of tourists that come in and have a good time. And that's why drugs, sex trafficking can be such a big deal. And so you're basically saying you guys trying to educate, let's say, the hospitality industry, hotels. So for hotel staff, management, people to check in, people that are cleaning the rooms, things like that, to kind of show them, hey, things to be aware of. Not to say that they're, you know, always going to be correct, but there's something that stands out, hey, we this might need to be looked at. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Actually, you literally took the words right out of my yeah. mouth. Just showing those indicators on what to look for. Not that one thing may be, oh, God, this is human trafficking, but this with this and that could all be. And we wanted to make a relationship with these establishments knowing, look, you can give us a call and the resolution basically saying that we can work parallel with law enforcement. We know they're overworked, they're understaffed Mm -hmm. and they're not getting all these complaints. So just let us help. You know, we, we feel like we know what we're doing and we know what to look for. Right. So let us help you. Right. And it it is, you know, and we have a vice unit there in Tulsa and it's six, seven officers maybe. And that's, who's responsible for handling all the human trafficking. And that's it. They're overworked then for sure. That's it. Yeah. But our nonprofit is called Operation Rose, so check it out. Is Rose is it named after somebody or? So there's it's it's also a double meaning. Um, You're very witty. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have time, Jason? We got time. Um, so the long story is when my, I talked about my dad earlier, and in January, which so happens to be Human Trafficking Awareness Month, this this January of 2021, um, we kind of had the idea, I was talking with other human trafficking experts in the field, and the guy I mentioned and all that, we didn't have a name, pretty much every www.com and .org is taken, so you got to think of something crafty. Went to visit my dad right around the corner. He's buried. Actually, you could see if you step outside, you probably see the hill he's on right here behind us. 
Um, went up there just uh, just to visit him. I mean, I might be weird, but I go to his grave and just say, hey, what's He's up? your dad. Nothing weird about that. There was one single rose on his headstone. And this was no, it wasn't around any holiday. It was the end of January. I look around, there's no other roses anywhere. I call my sisters and my mom. I said, did you put a rose on dad's grave? They said, no, we didn't do that. So, you know, I kind of got like the chills, but then also saw him. He was big in the Catholic church. So, you know, as an usher and stuff, but every like little holiday and stuff, he would hand out flowers no matter what it was. And I, it made people smile. So men, women, but you know, most of your trafficking victims are women and children. What, what woman doesn't love a rose right. or rose is? That and my daughter's name is Ori Rose. All right, so there we go. So uh, all comes um, together, it works. So yeah, it's it's a double meaning, but uh, yes, Operation Rose dot org, and you know we just got our five hundred one status a few months back, but I think we're really going to carve out a niche that no one else is really doing. I think that if we can work well with law enforcement, it's really going to make a, an impact. Yeah, that's they, everybody talks community policing, and that that's what it takes. It takes the public and the police department. It's not just on the police department. Well, Bobby, we are out of time. One last cheers to you, brother. Cheers, cheers and plug it. your yeah. uh, plug your sites real quick, and we'll get out of here. My what? I'm sorry. Your uh, sites where we can oh, find you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought you said stats. Like, oh, you want all those cocaine stats? <laughs> yeah, we want that. No. <laughs> well, I'm five foot eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, 200 and something. <laughs> um, so my business website is Covert Results, C-O-V-E-R-T-R-E-S-U-L-T-S, CovertResults.com. Not to be mistaken with COVID results. <laughs> okay. Because we get a lot of damn calls about, I need my COVID <laughs> results. <laughs> Shit, I'm glad that stuff's almost over. And uh, the human trafficking nonprofit is operationrose.org. Well, Bobby, man, thank you so much for being here with us. This is our uh, our first remote podcast that we've done like this. So you are uh, you broke the cherry for us. And huge thank, uh, thanks for Nashville Barrel Company as well. Thank you all for having me. Take care.